Hi, everybody. The timekeeper's over there if you're like dying to know about that. I, I took my watch off so that I could talk for a couple of hours. Um, so uh, I'll let you all find your seats. We're apparently not running late, so I want everybody to know that up front. Um, I have about 42 pages to get through, so uh, I hope you have a good glass of water. So hi. Um, I appreciate the Fedora community for once again inviting Red Hat to come here and give this talk. And that has included an extension of an invitation for me to come and deliver it. Now this talk has a bit of history. It's called, What Does Red Hat Want? The reason it's called that is because traditionally the head of platform engineering at Red Hat would show up at Flock and he'd talk to Fedorans about what Red Hat was thinking about. And since 2021, I've been giving this talk and my role is the community guy at the Red Hat Enterprise Linux business unit. And this is a challenging talk to give. You see, this talk isn't just my thoughts and my opinions. I have to go through Red Hat and collect all of the opinions and thoughts that I can get my hands on and then sift through them and sort them and try to make them into something that can be presented. There are a lot of opinions and thoughts inside of Red Hat. And another challenge with this talk is the audience. Yeah, all of you. Because I'm talking to two different communities and you have two different ideas of what you want to do and two different ways that you want to do it and two different governance processes and thoughts. On top of that, a number of you work for Red Hat. And some of you have shown up here today thinking about your positions in these various communities. And some of you have come here thinking about your day jobs. And still more of you are conflicted in trying to think about all of that at once. And not only are there community members here from Fedora and CentOS, but there are people from other communities who are present. They might be in this room, they may be watching the recording later or the live stream. There are also going to be Red Hat competitors, members of the media, and more. This is a really broad audience to try and talk to. So for this reason, I, I hope that you'll give me some space and go into this talk understanding that not everything that I say is meant just for you. And for some of you, you're going to be listening to this talk and you're going to be crying out for more details because the premise that I'm presenting is so obvious and so clear. On the other hand, at some points, you're going to not really understand that premise up front, and you may need to reflect and zen on it some more. And so if I were to pack the talk full of details, it would overwhelm you, or you'd get caught up in the details of one specific example. And so for those of you who are looking for details, take a look at the rest of the flock schedule. Red Hat does not program this conference in any way centrally. Um, some of what I say, for example, is going to echo what Matthew said earlier, but that's only because he happened to see a preview of my talk, not because we prepared his talk together. So what you find on the schedule often represents where Red Hat has some form of interest or concern. So go out there, learn about a new project, learn about a new noun, learn about a new verb. There are no slides for this talk, so you can stop looking over here. What I have found in the last few years is that not having slides has helped me focus this talk. And what I'm hearing from people in the audience is that not having slides has helped them focus on listening. Now, I do have pretty extensive notes, so you will see me look down quite a bit. This talk follows from the previous talks that I've given here. In 2022, I talked a lot about how the future of Fedora is Fedora. And in that talk, I laid out a plan and a belief that I thought Fedora should enact about meeting its users and becoming a space for innovation. And in 2023, I talked to both the Fedora and the CentOS projects together at once for the first time. And I talked a lot about how code and community differ and how we need to understand all of the players in the space so that we can all work together well and where we don't want to work together, work not together non-destructively. Both of those talks were ultimately about change, when to make it, and how to make it in partnership with others or apart from others. 
And change is going to be a big theme in what I talk about today, too. So in the talk today, I want to start by talking about the Linux market and the state of open source. And then I want to talk about some of the conclusions that we've drawn on what's going on around that uh, at Red Hat. And finally, I want to share some of what Red Hat's thinking needs to happen. And I expect that what we think needs to happen should feel very natural to you as something that you want to participate in. And I want to make sure that you feel invited and welcome to join us on that journey. So let's start by talking about the state of open source in the Linux market. Even if you don't follow Red Hat news, and there has been a ton of Red Hat news in the last year, I hope you're all keeping up with what's going on in open source and with other distributions. I hope you're watching how they're growing and changing and succeeding or failing. This is the space that the Fedora and the CentOS projects occupy, and you need to know what's going on around you. You need to know your surroundings. At Red Hat, we have recognized that the line that used to exist between open source and commercial interests is not bright and crisp anymore. It's a very blurry line now. It's blurrier than it ever has been. And this ultimately is the state of open source. A simple example of this is that the commercial open source model that used to be stabilize the code, provide some 1-800-CALL-ME support, is no longer the differentiator that it used to be. What we're seeing is that the projects have gotten a lot better. They're really good. Project practices have gotten a lot better. More and more projects are now shipping more and more versions of their code. They're not just shipping head. And more and more projects are seeing that third parties are showing up in their spaces and offering support-like offerings around their code bases. Consumers of open source have changed. What they're now willing to do in terms of expenses that they'll pay to hire their own experts has changed. They're not just looking for third parties to help them. They're now starting to look at support offerings from the perspective of being insurance. And this is all because tolerances in the market have changed. What people will put into production today is very different than what it is or what it used to be. Now, don't get me wrong, Enterprise Linux still matters. It's just that enterprises have many more definitions of that term than they used to. And these definitions now encompass a continuum of differing beliefs around everything from code quality and maturity to risk tolerance, software delivery, service delivery options, etc. Put another way, people have come to realize that in some cases, they can absorb change a lot faster than they used to be able to, or that they can accept more downtime than they used to be able to. They've learned that the market doesn't necessarily penalize failure as hard as it used to, or reward success as much as it used to. If you think about this, you can think of many companies that you know of that have suffered own goal data breaches. And generally, they've come out just fine. They've had some tough months, for sure, but the net result in the end has been, uh, you know, okay. And I want to be clear here, I'm not talking about CrowdStrike. Um, I don't think their story has been written yet. But I do want to say that if you have on your bingo card that everybody's still using CrowdStrike in two years, I don't think you're out of the game, and I don't think you're necessarily wrong either. The world just changed. And this change in tolerance and needs has resulted in a general flattening of the entire market. And at its core, what this means is that open source has become more like commercial product, and commercial product has become more like open source. Things don't necessarily go now from a wild west upstream to a stabilized and sensible enterprise solution. But this isn't just about code quality and maturity. It's really about the magnitude of the promises that companies are now willing to make around code. We can add to this changing patterns in hardware. 
It used to be that companies like Red Hat, we had about 18 months to move hardware from inception to the market. That's now about six months. And while open source development in that space has become more and more of a given, there's still a strong prevalence of out-of-tree development. And where there is in-tree development, we're finding that there needs to be more spaces for collaboration and more ability for projects and companies to see what little bit of differentiation there may be left around hardware support. And that differentiation is starting to disappear. So what does all of this mean? Well, we've been watching this at Red Hat. And because we have a commercial product, we get some additional data points that aren't necessarily available to open source projects. In particular, we can see who's buying software, what they're using that software for, and what they're not using that software for. And we've been watching this continuation, or this continuum of needs and desires and tolerances develop. We've been watching how folks interact with the enterprise Linux family of distributions. And what we've concluded from this is that the path to RHEL is broken for new users. I'll say that again. The path to RHEL is broken. There are huge gaps that are in the work that is done by the Fedora project, the CentOS project, and in RHEL. And these aren't the kind of gaps that are like puddles on a sidewalk where you take a running jump to get over them. They're often insurmountable chasms, depending on the space that we're talking about. And so, from the perspective of the Fedora and CentOS project, we believe that this path to RHEL being broken is really important. And it's, it's not about the path leads to happy customers. That, that's not where the focus for those projects is. It's because the path when working creates a clear family of enterprise Linux distributions that can meet all of the user's needs wherever they are on this continuum. And we, all of us, should want to be able to meet those users' needs. We recognize that sometimes Red Hat customers have unique or distinctive needs, but their needs are generally reflected in the similarity of needs with other users. And so we think that we should all have answers for these folks. Relatedly, we've become worried about some of the things that we're seeing in projects. There are some ideas and practices that go on that we think need to be talked about and tested for validity and determined if there's still things that we should do. Software delivery is one of those, and it's a critical one. We believe we need to do more to embrace the variety of software delivery options that are available. Software delivery options there being packaging. RPMs are great, don't get me wrong, but more and more people are saying that more and more software is not best delivered that way. Not all software is life cycled the same way, audited the same way. And in some cases, people are finally recognizing that changing a format from format A to format B doesn't add a lot of value. Now, I mentioned hardware a little earlier. It's not just moving faster, but it's getting different uses, and, and it's being used in really different ways than it used to be. At Red Hat, we're heavily focused on servers. There are a lot of definitions for a server, and we're seeing more server-like objects every day. And we think that projects need to be able to accommodate more formats and form factors than they ever have in the past. We need an approach that will allow us to not only look at the kinds of hardware that exist, but how those pieces of hardware get used. For example, we have customers who are buying high-end workstations for their employees, and at night those workstations become nodes in large processing clusters, two very different uses of the same piece of hardware. Related to this, we want to understand how we as a group of projects and products can more easily accommodate new chips and GPUs and architectures as first-class citizens faster. How can our projects be more inviting? And welcoming people to our projects isn't just about making sure there's room in the tent. We need to make sure that people can do what they came to do. 
Communities have seemed to take an approach where doing something different requires an exception. But an analysis of those exceptions will show that they tend to become the central part of being distribution projects. So how can we address these in a way that allows us to be more permissive or to allow for more change in a safe way? To quote a conversation that was had inside of Red Hat recently, the request was, don't tell me not to break the rules. Tell me how to break the rules safely. And addressing these challenges ultimately speaks to adding contributions or adding contributors. Now, Fedora has been debating a strategy focused on increasing the number of contributors. And the CentOS project has been having similar talks about the people who are in the SIGs and the number of SIGs and how those work. And at Red Hat, our version of that conversation is focused around partners. And it's a conversation we're, consti we're constantly having. You see, partners matter, and they should matter to all of us. Because the ecosystem of partners that Red Hat motivates around Enterprise Linux is of critical importance and value to all of us. This is a set of partners who are interested and focused on making sure that their product works better or best on RHEL. And this means they're focused on continuously improving that experience. And they're looking to the Fedora and the CentOS projects as spaces where they can join together and create influence. Now, we're seeing that take two forms, typically. The first, and this is part of the change that we're seeing, is that more of our ecosystem members are working directly in the upstreams. And then they're looking at the Fedora and the CentOS projects to see how the code flows through. This, doesn't, this means that they're not participating as much directly, but it doesn't diminish the importance of the projects to them. But the other form of this is when they want to go to market and deliver a solution. And at Red Hat, what we have found is that that is best done when it's a three-way conversation between Red Hat, the hardware vendor, and the workload or software vendor. And the even better version of that when it's, is when it's done via an open source process. That means it needs to be done in the Fedora and the CentOS projects. So how can we all work together to make that happen? This isn't something that only one of those people can motivate and do on their own. We all have to work together to create that invitation in space. Now, I didn't come here today just to talk to you about market updates and big ideas. Um, I have come here today as well to share at a high level what Red Hat wants to do about some of this. And so I want to return to that statement about the path to RHEL being broken. And I hope that I've made it clear why that path being broken is important to the Fedora and CentOS projects. And while it might feel obvious why that's important to Red Hat, it isn't just about us getting more customers. It's because we need that path to be a complete, continuous path. That change in tolerance in the market, well, that reflects the fact that not all workloads now need everything that RHEL offers. But there's still a role for Red Hat in those workloads. And we need to work in tandem with you so that we can build that continuous path so that we can help those that want our help. And those that don't want Red Hat's help, they're going to benefit from this thanks to the open source processes and ways that we work. So it's our intention to fix this path. And we invite you and hope you'll come along with us on that journey. I want to repeat that too. We really are inviting you, and we really are hoping you will join us on this. So what is that work going to look like? Well, one of the things you're going to see is that Red Hat's going to be shipping more and more products that are heavily tied to the underlying distributions. And these products may not look like distributions in a traditional sense. They may not resemble things that we have traditionally shipped. But what they are is going to be things that are opened up by the new opportunities of technology like bootable containers. And we're going to be looking at projects like Fedora and CentOS to help us manage the risk associated with this by having shared goals with you so that we're all aligned and pulling in the same direction 
even if we're ultimately serving different markets of users. Along those lines, product is going to start acting a lot more like open source, and that's a natural reaction to open source acting like product. An example of that's Apple. It's of increasing importance to our customers and partners. And so RHEL is going to get closer to Apple than it normally has been. Because what we have found is that the project has done amazing work to help those customers and partners. But there are some things the project just can't do. So we're going to fill in those gaps. And we're going to help our customers and partners use the amazing work that you've done in their stuff. And by in turn, that will enrich Apple. And that should also have a knock-on effect of enriching all of Fedora Linux and then ultimately the code in the CentOS project. It's a virtuous circle. Experimentation in new hardware is also going to be a must, and we're going to make sure that there's a platform available for that kind of experimentation so that all of us can easily enable new hardware and run the experiments that we need. Our ambitious goal? We'd like to be shipping in RHEL code six months after it first drops. That means it needs to move faster through the Fedora and the CentOS projects, and the today's quality and assurances need to be maintained in that process. So we're going to have to have processes in place to help that code become a first-class citizen faster. We think that moving code faster through the projects is good for the projects. It opens up more opportunities for you to meet more of your users where they are and to learn more things about what's going on and to lead. We're going to need to collaborate here to align around the goal. And the goal is deliver great software the open source way. Now, a lot of what I've touched on here, it's much more than Red Hat just showing up and contributing. There's a lot of intersection here between things like infrastructure and policy. And no one piece of that can do this alone, nor can any one piece of that um, be sufficient on it. Sorry, I'm saying that twice. Neither can lead, <laughs> nor is one sufficient on its own. So we want to work with the communities through your processes to figure out how we do this. Because we need to balance how both of those pieces are going to be moving overall across both communities to create the flexibility that's going to be needed for all of us. In conclusion, open source and the industry have changed, and they are continuing to change. And we want to work together with you to navigate the blurry lines between the projects and Red Hat. We want to work with you to better, need, better meet the growing variety of needs of all of our users. And we want to be able to meet those users' needs faster. At Red Hat, we look forward to continuing to work with all of you to deliver great software the open source way. And I've just been told I'm out of time, so thank you. <laughs> And I believe it is lunch. <laughs> <laughs>